So, just before we go into talking about the, the, the snooker sports side, what I was very interested to know that you worked, uh, I think it was Graham was working with Andrew, Andrew Gold. Yes, that was interesting. Um, we finally got on Warner Brothers Records in America, having had about so many failures on Mercury. And that they suggested Andrew Gold came over as a producer for 10CC, and then they sort of bonded together at that stage. And then when everything fell to pieces with the punk era and everything, uh, Graham and Andrew got together, I think, around about 85 and started doing some beautiful music as well. Nice. And I think that was Graham's happiest time in his life. Because whatever you say about 10CC, I could say that Herman and the Hermits were in love with each other as we went <laughs> through the euphoria of going from nothing to the biggest band in the world. And everybody was round each other's shoulder and everything was hunky-dory. You couldn't say that about 10CC because yes. they'd be battling there was on lots of whatever angst. it was. You, did you really enjoy your time, you know, managing snooker players, Jimmy White? and I loved it. Things. I loved it. It was holiday camp. It was... It was incredible. It, it didn't was, worry you that you didn't know the world. I mean, you were... I, <laughs> I got more publicity in six weeks of snooker than I had in 20 years of rock, <laughs> rock and roll. It was the hottest thing in the country. And we got this Jimmy White, who was an exciting player. And it was just fantastic. And I, I so I got the show for, well, I, I did have a show for them. Because I wasn't with Carl. I used to go to the Crucible. I was driven there in the morning. Green room, free drinks, food. And guess what? In the hall, there's Ladbrokes, Hills, and Corals. You can bet on every frame. You can bet on every horse race. So I was there drinking. This was my management position. Oh, no, it was yes. like a complete holiday camp from morning to night for three years with the most ridiculous things happening all the time. And we managed Willie Thorne. Tony Knowles came into the camp. We handled it. Alex Higgins. Oh, my God. It just, it was just... It was a boys' night out. Was Danny was Danny involved in that or not? Danny, yeah. Well, we had a firm called Sports World, and Danny was involved, obviously. But um, it was kind of yeah, indirectly involved because the Sports World was Jeff Lomas, Roy Speaker worked for Danny, myself, and another guy called Fred Summers. So he, I, I'm trying to remember. I'm sure Danny was involved. Yeah, he would have been. Danny was involved in everything. We we wanted to, I wanted the ten Kennedy Street to be the biggest company in the world, and I wanted to go public. That was my aim in life. Mm -hmm. I thought that's the only way I could capitalize on the success. Yes. Otherwise, all that's happening is I'm spending all the money. Danny's a very careful person, nine to five, oh, nine to seven, whatever, yeah. works every day. Everything and I was the kind of guy that came in with crazy ideas, which were too crazy for words. And then one might happen, and that's great. And I wanted to represent all classical music. Only one fault: you couldn't, because it was controlled by goodbye. You can stand on your bloody head; you won't get arrested. Oh, so my no. idea was: if you play classical music, you don't have to worry about who the artist is. You know, you've got the, you just put the concert on and make them. You couldn't get in there. Yeah. I wanted to get into comedy. So we got, um, we got an act called Cannon and Ball, actually, at the time, and directly through Stuart Littlewood, who very kindly took him off our hands when they got some success. And then Michael Hughes controlled all the um, people in Liverpool, all the comedians, so you couldn't get a smell in there. As regards sport, I, I managed Gary Owen, who is the England under-21 football captain, and tried to get him transferred to Manchester United, and they put the phone down on me, so we don't speak to managers. But I couldn't develop anything. So and Danny that's why you wanted to turn it into a public company and then... Actually... Well, we had the publishing, we had everything going for us. Yeah. So what happened? But Danny didn't want it. Danny just want, refused point that. blank because... He, I don't think he wanted other people looking over his shoulder. Yeah. And he never spent any money, Danny. So he always, uh, he was sort of a, what's the word? He amassed his fortune. Yeah. But I did the opposite. He spent yours. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> It's like it's like the joke. This the have you heard the joke about the two Jewish women that 
are, are talking to each other. And Mrs. Levy, how's your how's your son doing? She says, Oh, she's not too bad. He says it's he's got um he's got a nice house in um, Surrey, and he's got um, a yacht in the south of France. And he's a lawyer. He's very nice. And what about you, Mrs. Carr? Oh God, it's terrible, Mass. It's terrible. What do you mean? He says, hasn't he got a Rolls Royce? He says, yes, got a Rolls. and he's got a plane, and yes, and he's got oh, a house in Park Lane as well. And what's the problem? Only oh, only earns fifteen pound a week. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the same thing, That's you know. Good. You can always spend more. You can always spend more than you earn. And the biggest fool can ask more questions than the wisest man can answer. Yeah. So I sent you a dashboard of dials, of um, your mental health dials, and I said, could you choose two that were important to, to you as a sort of, yeah, these two make sense. What are they? Yeah, stress is a very, it's, it's horrible. Yes, I have a lot of stress in my life, yes. I think all my stress would be financial. And this problem of spending more than you earn and not being able to say to Carol, no, I don't want to have a Louis XIV armchair in a, in a cottage which we don't use. You know, that sort of thing. Um, not, I always wanted to please people and that, that could sort of hurt me in a way. I, 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 was not, I, I couldn't control my own expenditure because I always thought money would always come in and it yeah. always did. So... It wasn't that, like, be sensible. You, what happens if it suddenly dries up? I, don't, yeah. I didn't think like that. So there's always a stress. And if you're gambling as well and you're losing, and you've got, you owe the bookmaker's yeah. money, you owe the mortgage company money, you, you owe this one, that one. Again, it all piles up on top of you. And that gives you the stress, which I don't think is very good for you. As far as a health concern, I think stress is the worst thing of all. Yeah. Well, I think stress... And you're saying, how do you deal with it? Well, I didn't drink to deal with it. Yeah. Um, I did do exercise at one stage when I was that age, that exercise was fun. Um, I used to go walking and things like that, which I liked doing. Um, swimming, I liked. Uh, I liked I quite like exercise. I think exercise at my own level, not because yeah. I have to do a regime and lift weights and God knows what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just like walking, fresh air, golf. Well, that's good. No, that is good for that is good for stress. Also, not putting yourself in a stressful situation. Well, that's which, difficult. That is difficult. I know. I know. But if because you're, gambling, you're you know, seduced by well, it's not only the gambling. It was. I always wanted. I suppose, in a way, I was competing in the rat race. Always being up with the Joneses creates a tremendous pressure on you. If I'd have stayed in my first house. And I'd do what Danny did. Danny used to go on the same holiday every year to for two weeks to somewhere. He bought a flat there and he went there every two weeks. And I went around the bloody world. Yeah. You know, <laughs> in five star hotels. But you, have to be, you have to be true to yourself, don't you? I mean, that's the Well, thing. when I was 50, I said to Carol, look, I want to go around the world with you. I don't want to do it when I'm 80, when I can't move. And we went to every country. We went right around the world on a wonderful world trip. And uh, I never regretted that. Whereas I couldn't see somebody like Danny ever doing that in a million years because no. A, he wants to see Manchester City at the weekend or whatever. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, let's look, Shaka and Asongu, you know? Yeah. And uh, my, my partnership with Danny was priceless. You yeah. had one person that's dead careful, the other person that's a lunatic, and then the two come together. And when things are going well, Boy, they're going well. But when things aren't going well, then there's a tension because the tension also is the stress because you're taking money out of the company, so the other guy's got to take it out even though he doesn't want to. So you can't build up the company because one partner's taking all the money out. I mean, I acted like yeah. an idiot at times, you know, but, you know, I was out of, I was out of control, actually. No, I'm sure, yeah. It's, it's interesting. And I wasn't alone. I yeah. mean... I, I could never understand people like Brian Epstein. He spent, you know, hours at a roulette table, cover every number, and <laughs> what's, what's all that about? You know, I mean, the guy was the biggest thing. I mean, can and you imagine? Didn't last. Nope. Well, that was a bit, that was a bit sad. Shame, really. Um, he was a nice guy. 
Okay, we're gonna we're gonna come to the end now. What have you learned from from writing this book, living where you are? I don't know how long you've been in Palm Springs. Since nineteen ninety. Oh. oh really? Yeah, but I was a snowbird for about you know, a snowbird for probably thirty years and we bought a house in two thousand and five. Right. And then with COVID I've not been back to England. And that's when the book uh, evolved from right. being here on COVID. Did it did you enjoy writing it or did you hate writing it and now enjoy it? Um what I did was I, I Charlie Thomas wrote the book. He was um originally a sports guy um yeah. on Sky T V and then he did the 10cc documentary bbc because he did uh, the documentaries oh and right i i didn't know he even wrote anything i just said look would you like to do a book come up to palm springs spend a few days and let's put it all down so he came up like we're talking now and we talked for about four hours a day and then he uh, and he put his and the great thing was he put his angle on it he was a fan at Nebworth. He was at that concert. So I was in the back having a rouse with Bannister and the, for all the problems. And he was in the front with all the drug orientated marijuana smoke that was going <laughs> around. And, and so we had the both sides of the story. And also he described it from his point of view. So it's really quite good. So when you hear about half of it is probably some of it is his but the stories are all mine obviously and the yeah. stories are priceless and the thing about it is it's brought me so much information after the book things i don't know like i told you the story about johnny ham i didn't realize that but it was in his book you know and, and, you, and you presumably reunited with it with a few chums and from people. oh unbelievable i yeah. spoke to a guy yesterday i've not spoken to for 71 years <laughs> That <laughs> takes some dude, doesn't it? That does. Oh, blimey, when you're only 50, that's quite extraordinary. And he lives in um, <laughs> some obscure place. I can't remember. It's Crete or somewhere. All these people live all over the place, Indonesia. It's incredible. It's a small world. Wow. So have you got any parting words for us, Harvey? That's what we want to know here on Shed Chat. Um, I mean, you know. Yeah, I think if people say, why was I successful or what was the main contributing factor? I think, well, firstly, I had a tremendously strong upbringing with lots of love. So I was very, um, very confident all the time and nothing frightened me. And I think you've just got to, if you believe in something, you've just got to go for it and you've got to be prepared for a lot of rejection. And I think you've not got to really take any notice of the rejections i think mm. you've got to you just got to keep plowing on because so many people would tell me how, how rubbish herman's hermits were and what i was wasting my time for and those people just knew nothing they just talked for the sake of talking and they're very cynical people yes. are very cynical you know you, and and that, you've got, in a way, yeah. you've got to be po positive about everything you do otherwise don't do it yeah and um, um, having a having a strong marriage and all that, and that must have made a big difference. I mean, Carol, in your life, it was it was wonderful. You know, I, we were never apart. You know, she'd come down to London or whatever. I mean, we just we were a team. You know, and, and um, that was really great. But um, but I must say, I had all I had most of my success, my, my huge success was before I met Carol. So I don't yeah. really. What happened was I, I acted like the goat till about, I was 27. And having had enough of the excesses of life, I thought, I've got to settle down. I've had enough of this, you know, and that was it. I made that decision and then I got serious about my relationships or what I was looking yeah. for. Whereas before it was just a trip on uh, Frank Sinatra's cast-offs. You know, <laughs> it's just, it just, it got stupid, you know, and you just forget it. It wasn't living, it was just, uh, I think a lot of the groups were like that for a long period. They just got on this roller coaster of excesses. Yeah. The one big thing I think you said actually was don't take rejection uh, personally, you know. That's a big deal. A lot of people do. I mean, can't. rejection from somebody you really respect. You know, if I was doing a program on um, 
on nature. Yeah. And David Attenborough said to me, you know, that isn't really worth doing. I'd listen to him. But I'm not going to listen to my mate next door telling me to stop wasting my time. Yeah. Because they don't know from Jack. Yeah. Okay. Well, Harvey, I think we've come to the end. It's um, We could go on <laughs> for about several hours without a doubt. But thank you so much for being such a groovy, uh, wondrous source of uh, information, storytelling, and uh, great, and we'll, we'll revisit this in 10 years' time. <laughs> <laughs>